This is Melina Lee Williams Haas. I deeply appreciate you listening and taking the time to hang out with me. I will be addressing issues of life, the universe, and everything that are often bogged down and mired in shame and grief, and talk about how they can be repackaged to be useful and gorgeous and fucking awesome for you. So, sit back and relax, or, you know what? Sit up and freak out. However, you prefer to listen. Let's go. Oh my god. Have you ever gotten anybody else laid off for Christmas? I don't think so. I did have a couple of people that I did wind up hooking up with. There was this one guy, David, who was like an ass eater. And he was someone that I knew. David the ass eater. Yeah. I know him. Yeah. You probably did. I probably do. <laughs> My friends used to go, I'm thinking about getting together with this guy. I'm like, what's your email address? Yeah, you don't want to get together with that guy. Like, I knew him all. <laughs> but I don't recall David the Ass Eater. Tell me about him. Well, he was someone that I, like, knew peripherally from the scene, but he was mostly, like, in the far East Bay. But then when I started working in the East Bay, I had put up a Craigslist, like, because we started, like, challenging each other to, like, lunchtime casual encounters. Like, can you get late over lunch? So, like, it'd be, like, you know, like, 1230. Like, you have until 1.30 to put up the ad, get laid and get back for lunch. Like this was the challenge that I had with another friend of mine, some crazy perverted opera singer girl. And um, (laughs) this one, (laughs) David the ass eater and the crazy perverted opera singer girl. Okay, got it. She was a mess, awesome human being. And at the time, a bit of a mess, but I did get a live one and they wrote to me, I was, running out of the office because I was like, oh, I only got a certain amount of time. And he was in the East Bay. So I was like, this is easy. And then we got the I got there and I was like, haven't we met? And he was like, oh yeah, we have. And he's like, you didn't realize who I was? I said, no, because I didn't know him. And it's not like David's such a rare name that like whatever. But I like met him at like some lunch a couple of years prior or whatever. And he's just has an ass eating fetish. And so his whole shtick was you show up, you take a little shower so that he, you know, the, with the thing. He eats your ass and then you leave. And then that's it. Like if you needed a beverage, he would provide you with a beverage, et cetera. And so I had that going on for like a couple of years, which is actually quite nice. Could you get off on the ass eating? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Just worried about you there for a minute. No, okay. no, 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 no. Oh my God. No. Sounded rather perfunctory. Eat my ass and have a beverage. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very easily amused. I have a basically like any repetitive affectionate motion on any part of my body and eventually I will have an orgasm. Okay. <laughs> So like, like if someone just does this little thing in the back of the neck, you know, like you get that little neck shiver thing. If someone tickles the back of your neck just right, if you do that for like half an hour, eventually I'll have like a full body orgasm. I'm jealous of that. It's a pretty good body to be in. It's yeah. Not bad. Yeah. I feel very ripped <laughs> off right now. <laughs> it's like, it's so funny because one of the things, I hope this doesn't stick with me, it, it gets less weird. But when I was a kid, one of the ways my mom would get me to sleep when I was like, rambunctious and psychotic is that she would do this thing where she would just like gently pull and tickle the hairs on the back of my neck and I'd just be like <clears throat> come to find out science it's a vagus nerve thing it's a whole there's a whole bunch of nerves that run there that actually do neurological calming patterns yeah and so now like and then, and then like every time I would date someone I'd be like you need to do this thing on the back of my neck but most people get tired of it after a while then you meet crazy fucking Austrian who's like I can do it for hours and I'm just like, oh, my God, you're the best human being on the planet. Oh, my God. So, like, I just lay there just like forever while he does a little tickly thing. Why am I talking about the tickly thing? I don't what know. But about? you were just talking about the repetitive thing. Oh, right. And the not- ass eating guy. Right, right, the right. So, guy. yes. So, yes. It's it's not a problem at all for me to, like, have analingus be a orgasm response track. You just reminded me of a story that is not casual encounters related, but it Ooh. was you said – Hey, don't we know each other? When I <laughs> when I lived in Atlanta, I used to hang out at this bar and I lived on Peachtree Avenue, also known okay, as- Okay, shut up, because that tells me nothing because every fucking street is in Peach Atlanta Tree. is Peachtree So Peachtree Avenue is the Buckhead ghetto. It has the Peachtree, it's in Buckhead, very expensive neighborhood, but it's a dump. It's the whole street is just dumpy apartments. So I lived in the Buckhead ghetto. It was a terrible neighborhood. Mm. And so I'm living in that neighborhood. I hook up with this guy. We're having sex and both of us get bored in the middle of it. Just kind of like, this is not really 
doing it for me, you know? And he's looking at me right there in my face and I'm looking at him and I'm just like, and he goes, I think I'm going to go. I'm like, okay. <laughs> kind of feeling that way too. And he gets up and he puts his pants on and he leaves and I go back. There used to be this oh my God. Mexican restaurant that served like 72 ounce margaritas mm -hmm. in these gigantic yeah. glasses. And I'm at this bar and I'm drinking and this guy starts talking to me and he's just like, where do you live? I'm like, Shambly Tucker Road, you know, 15 miles away. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I'll drive you home. Shit face drunk driving me home. And we get oh, back dear. to the house and uh, we start having sex. And just halfway through, I'm just looking at him and he's looking at me. He goes, did you used to live in Buckhead? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. How, he goes, how much time had elapsed? Like a half an hour, something like Wait, that. What? Yeah, we just didn't recognize each other at all. What? Yeah, we're just you had just fucked. Yeah, no, we were in the middle. We weren't done. We were in the middle, going. I we stopped I, in the see, middle. When and you're telling the story, I assume that you had forgotten to say. And a month later, I didn't realize it was literally the same fucking day. No, it wasn't the same day. But it was, I had moved. I'd moved out of the neighborhood. So there was time in between. There was time in so between. How long had, so, so let me ask a question again. How long had elapsed since the incident? Like a year. Okay, fine. Thank you. Like a year. Okay, fine. Great. But I totally took him home, got halfway through half an hour of sex with him, and then we recognized each other from our sex styles. And he just went, <laughs> did you still live in Buckhead? I'm like, yeah. Have we done this before? And he's like, yeah. And it's still bad. So he puts his pants on. And we never did it a third time. So that's good. We oh learned our lesson. Oh, my God. Yeah. I was now, and I was just like, can I match the story? And then I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so this is. Oh, gonna, are you one is, upping me? Go for it. This is going to start off super tragic. Okay. So, so just stay with me. So I should stop masturbating right now. No, you can. Continue, please. <laughs> Hey, here's the thing. I don't harsh anyone. Like, if you have a September 11th kink, that's fine. I mean, oh. it's been long enough, I feel. Wow. So the morning of September 11th, actually, Julie Baum was a person who called me because she was working on East Coast Hours mm -hmm. and calls me and is like, you need to turn on the TV. And I'm like, holy shit. And at the time, like, just the Tower 2 plane had hit. So you're looking at a fire in the thing. And then as you're watching TV, the other thing happens. And it's like shock, horror, horror, shock. And like, I just sat there all day, the, all the shit with my family, like my sister worked down there, you know, she was like five blocks away, you know, it was, it was a very horrible day. And so of course there's only so much alcohol you can drink. And I finally was just like, I just want to fuck. I just want to fuck. So like middle yeah. of the night, I put up a, an ad and I was like, any other New Yorkers here? Fucking like freaking out. I want OG New Yorkers. I want someone who's also experiencing panic and, 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 and dismay in the same way I am to just have like a life affirming fuck moment. And you wrote that in San Francisco? Yes. Okay. And I got like a dozen responses. And most of them, we just started just swapping stories about how our families were doing. But then this one guy sent me a photo and he was so unbelievably like traditionally good looking, mm -hmm. like standard, like tall rugged jawline the whole thing and usually those guys are not the ones who are like trying to fuck fat bitches but he happened to like fat bitches so there you have it so he came over and we both like fucked and cried which is like one of the more awkward things that's ever happened but it was also very cathartic and Sounds very awesome it was actually really great and i think we hooked up one more time but it wasn't like super you know whatever but it was fine we had like we had that bonding moment and then we had one more follow-up so we had less sad sex yeah and then however many years later, I don't know, I am in San Jose for a, a leather event and I'm performing in the opening ceremony for this leather event. So I have some elaborate costume, like some big, I had this big, I know what it was. I had this huge cloak that was designed to look like an owl that had been lent to me by evil mommy Tina, who was coordinating this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm standing in the, you know, like outside this ballroom where the thing is happening and I have this thing on, I've got like my corset and the whole nine yards and this incredibly hot man like looks at me and does a triple take and is checking me up and down. I'm like, yeah, look at this hot guy. And he walks past and like 30 seconds later, I'm like, oh. and I turn around and he's standing at the end of the hall and he stops 
Mm-hmm. And I say he is just turned around and mm-hmm. we're looking at each other from like down this long hallway. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God. And he's like, oh my God. And he's like, how are you? I'm like, I'm I'm all right. How are you? And he's like, good. Have a great day. <laughs> like, and he just kept going. And I'm like, see you later. And I like walked on stage and did my thing. That is a great story. But wasn't it, it was just, it was what was so amazing about it is that like we recognized each other, but didn't feel the need to do anything else. It was just a sort of lovely moment of like, you were in my life for these two events that I will never forget. But it wasn't even about the sex. No, it was it about wasn't. the bonding. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I was like, wow, that was actually kind of a very touching moment. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of nice. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. This is going to be our final story because we're coming up on an hour. So I used to go to sex parties all the time and somebody would walk up to me and they'd give me that look like, hey, and I'm like, oh, I think I had sex with that person. <gasps> they clearly are looking at me like they know who I am and I don't know who they are. I'm like, hey, you, how's long? How long's it been? And they're See, like, this oh. is why I had Julie Baum help me make a spreadsheet because I kept forgetting everything. That is smart. I wish, <laughs> I wish I'd have had a Julie Baum in my life because I had no idea. And they'd just be looking at me like, hey, how you been? And I'm like, how long has it been? And they're like, Arr. and they wouldn't give me any clues. And then I'm like, I don't know how to get out of this. And so some, like a woman would walk by. I'm like, hey. Hey, do you two know each other? And hope they'd introduce yeah. to each other. And they just go, oh, yeah, yeah, we know each other. And I'm just like, oh, shit. God, now I got two of them. And I don't know who either one of them are. And then after a little while, I'm like, oh, that's right. You two had sex at the last party together, didn't you? I totally forgot. And they look at each other thinking they forgot. And then they go, oh, I, oh, oh. And then I back away slowly. And they'd never know that I didn't know who either one of them were. And I did that for a very long time. You are terrible. You are a bad person. I know I'm a bad person. <laughs> I don't come off looking really good on this last story of the episode. <laughs> and so I did that for a long time. And I assumed it was that I fucked too many strangers. And I was talking to Midori one day and Midori was like, do you do this and this and this? I'm like, yeah. And she goes, yeah, it's not the drinking. It's not the fucking, you have facial blindness. I'm like, mm. I do. And I'm like, how do you know? She goes, I have facial blindness. She describes her symptoms and I'm like, right. It all starts to come together. It yeah. starts to make sense. But then I started thinking back to when I first started having sex. Mm -hmm. And I used to go to adult bookstores with my gay best friend that I lost my virginity to, Brian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was gay and, you know, first sex, I'd kind of fallen in love with him. And good on him for at least putting in a good college try. You know, he tried twice in his life and he said, I don't really count you as not being, you don't count as a girl. Got that a few times in my life. But, like, you're the one woman I want to have sex with. Aww. Women are just not my thing. But you are my thing. And I'm like, well, that feels really special. But I'm in that place where he's gay. And yeah. I've kind of got a lot of feelings for him. Mm-hmm. And so I'd fuck with him a little bit. So we go to an adult bookstore. We're walking in. This gorgeous blonde construction worker who's all muscle is walking out at the same time. Just Brian's type. So I'm like, hey, where are you going? And he goes, oh, I'm leaving. There's no women in there. I'm like, well, I'm not inside yet, am I? Yeah. I was like 18. <laughs> Spicy. And Brian's looking at me like, she's doing this to me. Oh. So we walk inside and he's like, well, your boyfriend might not like it if I might get worked up in there and he might not like that. I'm like, we were still best friends right. at that point. And so the three of us shove into this tiny little adult bookstore and put quarters in and the movie's playing and we're and where was this? This was in Roanoke, Virginia. Yeah. Oh my God. Where I grew up. The biggest town near where I grew up in a town of 200. So the three of us are in this tiny little booth and Brian's being squished against the wall while the two of us are groping each other. And eventually he goes, I'm going to go find a gay film and get out of this booth. <laughs> so he goes down the hall and he does his own thing and we're trying to fool around, but I'm a fat girl and it's a tiny booth. Yeah. And eventually I'm like, do you want to just go somewhere else and he goes yeah yeah i know a place so i go knock on the door still i find brian brian come on we're going (laughs) so i get in this guy's car and i'm like brian give him the keys you drive my car follow us and we end up driving to this apple orchard nearby except apparently a section of it was a peach orchard i didn't know about so we go into the peach orchard section we park under this hill brian follows us he parks next to the car 
this guy goes into his trunk there's a blanket and a bunch of stuff like obviously he planned this stuff out sure i guess that's why he went to adult bookstores and found crazy 18 year olds with bisexual boyfriends and made them go to a pea torture with them and that went down in history for this dude i'm sorry that's just not every day that's just not every day that you look into that magnificence so i follow him up this hill we go to the top of this hill he lays down the blanket we start fooling around he climbs on top of me. It doesn't take him very long to come. And he sits back on his knees after he pulls out. And he's just looking at me. He goes, that was really good. And I'm like, uh, you're not done. And he's like, what? I'm like, I am come. And he's looking at me like, I've got three heads. Like, nobody's wow. ever said that to him. But that's the great thing about sex ed. You know that it's supposed to be mutual. And so he works on me for a while and I'm getting pretty close to coming, but Brian is now laying on the horn like, this takes too long. Whoa. And he is honking and it's very hard to come when somebody's laying on the horn like that. So eventually I do manage to get off. I'm kind of cranky and he's kind of cranky. And so I put my clothes back on and we're walking down the hill and say goodbye to get in the car. And Brian's really pissed off. So a month later, I, my other gay best friend, Steve, and I, he works at... Uh, the record store in the mall. And so I'm the going record to... record store yeah. in the mall. He was the assistant manager of the record store. He had long curly hair, wore pink latex leopard print tights and Converse high tops and looked exactly like the assistant manager of the record store would look like in, in whatever. 1980, whatever. 80 something. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm walking up to the glass doors to walk into Crossroads Mall and there's somebody walking from the outside coming in he sees me getting close to the door he grabs the door really quickly he swings out so that he can very elaborately open the door so that he's holding it from the outside yeah and i go thank you and he goes no thank you with a look on his face <laughs> so i and you're like get steve and we go to catawba emporium and we order coconut milkshakes and i'm at half an hour into lunch i'm like that's the guy I fucked in the peach orchard. Oh, my God. And he's like, Steve's like, what? I'm like, this guy was looking at me like he knew me, and I had no idea. And it was the look on his face that made me go, he knows me. I got to figure it out. And that was one of the first times I could have figured out I was facially blind. <laughs> you look back on your life and you go, oh, it all makes so much sense uh, now. I feel like you should have a final story, Mo. You need a denouement moment, kind of a bring it all around. <laughs> You're the queen of that. Come on. Give us those big feelings. Let us have just like a moment of reminiscing about how awesome this was this time. Because it was like the first point since junior high school where I felt good about like running around and having sex. You did it. You're bringing it around. Well you know? done. And I was like, because in high school, by the time I was out there and being like, yeah, let's go have sex. It was like, you could die. Yeah. You could die. Right. You know, despite the fact that I was like really into sex, I was like pretty conservative, even though I was like, you know, doing crazy shit, like fucking the fucking guitarist from this band, the connotations that I'd had a crush on, even though Alexis, yes, you told me not to do it, Alexis. I know. Now I'm going to have to be like, you have to listen to this episode because you get a shout out in this episode because my friend Alexis Stern was like, don't fuck this guy. And then like the rest of my life now, I'm just like, why am I fucking all these musicians? I thought it was his fault, but it's actually my dad's a musician and you never escape your fucking. No, it doesn't matter what you do. I was like, I'm going to marry this old white Austrian guy to get as far away from my father as I know. No. <laughs> <laughs> also a composer, also absolutely nuts. Also, absolutely traumatized. Like, I was like, oh, it's the same person. He's just an old white guy. <laughs> but it wasn't it just delightful that we had this period in our lives where we had the sensation of freedom and power. Exactly. And agency. Mm -hmm. Because I tell you, the overwhelming majority of people I knew who were having a good time on casual encounters was gay men and women. Yeah. So for real, like I would come in to work and like we would be at the break room downstairs and like the other three gay guys who were working there just like, so how's your weekend, how's your weekend? And we would swap these stories because it was fun. And it was one of the first times I remember like just having sex be something that was fun for me. Yeah. You and know? not being shamed for it. Not being shamed of it, not being shamed for it. It being like actually like a fun 
generative. I mean, there were a couple times I will say quite honestly, when it would be like Sunday afternoon and I'd be like, what should I do? And I'd be, and I would say, you know what? I have not got anything to hit them with Monday morning at work. Uh-huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's what I, that's what I said. I did it for the story. Yeah. That one, there were a 100% several times where that was my motivation where I was like, my weekend has been a little bit quiet. Let's throw one more in there. Well, when I was doing it, I had no idea it was about, it was for story for me. I knew it had to be weird. I knew I had to throw in some special effects, but I didn't know why I felt compelled. Like, do I care about the sex that much? Sex is great. Yeah, I'd love to have sex, but it can't just be any sex. It has to be exceptional. Like, I create a script. It's the experience. Yeah. And for me, it wasn't even that they agreed to those terms. If my favorite was if they came back and they said, yeah, that sounds good, but have you ever? And I'm like, oh, you You just one up to me. And that's what I was hoping for the whole time. I should not launch it to another story, but have you ever heard my story? No, Fuck. Have you ever heard my story? We're already over an hour. It's already costing me more. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Make her pay for it. (laughs) Have you ever heard my story, The Worst Sex Ever? I don't know. Is it worth closing the episode? Are you going to be okay with that? Yes. Okay, great. I do not have it at the ready, but I was just thinking about it. It doesn't have to be ready. Just this is a podcast, not a performance. I just don't want that feeling of like, oh, I forgot to tell you this part. That's just the worst feeling. So in the early days of Body, I would kick off every single one. I would announce a theme and then it was expected that I was going to be the first story to get the ball rolling because it was one of those before it was curated. It was like, oh, I've got one kind of thing. So I would always have to be the first story and I would announce the theme this month is sex parties and people go, oh, and you'd know you had one that people are going to have a story for. And the next one is going to be threesomes. (laughs) Oh, and one month I sent out a theme and I said, the theme this month is the worst sex ever. And everybody went, oh, and then the closer I got to the day, I was just like what's the worst sex i ever had i don't i can't even do i have a good enough story for the worst sex i mean do not tell me you curated bad sex yeah and you're oh yeah i mean i had those times where i'd gone to a guy's house and fucked him and he had five roommates and then all five of them high-fived him as he walked to the door <gasps> that was rude you know there were moments where guys pulled out their 11 inch dick that were actually six inches in the hot tub yeah, it's not the worst sex i ever had i didn't actually fuck that guy so i'm just thinking about do i have a story that's good enough and it's 24 hours before we're doing body and i don't have a story so i'm talking to sister mabel who's my boss and i'm like i don't have a story for body tomorrow night she goes do what you always do get on craigslist and write an ad and i'm like how do you write an ad for bad sex so the ad was entitled the worst sex ever. Want to help? And I said, I have to, in 24 hours, tell a story about the worst sex I've ever had in my life. And I desperately need a story. So if you think you can help me with that, send me some information, you know, and it was basically just like, help me with this. But nobody ever, I mean, I honestly didn't know if they actually read the ad or just saw a, sex and a just woman had posted the, it yeah. asking for sex and they just like spammed you that copy and paste thing. So I put it up and all of a sudden, like hundreds of responses start coming in and I'm watching my inbox fill up and I'm like, oh, I didn't wow. think this through. How do I pick somebody for the worst sex? I mean, what were people saying? What was the tenor of the fucking emails you it, were receiving? It wasn't really acknowledging that it was going to be the worst sex. Okay. So then people it was were just, just like, were just hitting, to, they just had their little pre-written thing. Yeah. yeah. And so I just like look at a few and I'm starting to have that panicky feeling like I, I'm in over my head. I don't even know how to do this now. So I just swirl my finger and I land on an email and I open it and it says, Hi. I really liked your ad. They're always intrigued by your ad. And he says, my name is Marcos. Uh, I live in Richmond. He attaches his phone number and he attaches a, some, there's an attachment to it and it is entitled hung JPEG. And I'm like, huh? So I click on it and it's a picture of his dick. It's laying against his belly. It's, it's a chub. He's very furry. He's Latin. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have called it hung jibbig, but sure. Okay. And I'm sitting there going, is that the one I'm going to 
have sex with for the worst sex ever. And I'm like, wait a minute. He sent me a picture entitled Hung JPEG. That has all the makings of the worst sex I'm ever going to have. This is my dude. So I write him back and I'm just like, hey, Marco, you are the grand prize winner. Give me your address so that I can come out to you. He replies with, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get on the 38 Geary, head to you. I'm not going to meet you in your house because you could be a serial killer. So be waiting at the bus stop. And so. (laughs) Because if that helps. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. We were fucking married people the whole time. We didn't put it together. (laughs) We were young, dumb, just looking for stories. (laughs) And so I get off the bus stop at 15th Avenue in Geary and he's standing there at the bus stop. And he looks kind of like a cross between, you know, Al Pacino and Marmaduke. He's kind of chubby. He's got a just. Al Pacino and Marmaduke the dog? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The dog. <laughs> the dog. Do you know a other person named Marmaduke? So. <laughs> <laughs> Not personally. <laughs> <laughs> Some people look like their dogs. He kind of looked like a dog. My God. And so we check each other out and I'm like, you don't look like a serial killer. Let's go. So we start walking up the block to his apartment. I love the way you've got such a look on my face like I'm an idiot. Like, well, what? Because to say they don't look like a serial killer, what does a serial killer look like? Very few of them actually look psychotic. Most of them just look like anybody. Right. True. Look at Leonard Lake. Look at Charles Ang. Look at those two. They were two of the worst and they just look like regular. Yeah. Regular ass little. Anyway, go on. Yeah. I mean, we have Marmaduke. I felt like I felt there was Marmaduke there Pacino. were steps I had to jump through <laughs> and I had done my due diligence. Okay, yeah. So Marmaduke Pacino it was about and me. you go back to his house. Yeah. yeah. So we're walking up the block. I'm just He's telling Marmaduke Pacino from now on. I also just love saying that. <laughs> it's a fun picture to it build is. in your, yeah. In yeah, your yeah. head. And so we get up the block, we get to this old Victorian building, really tall. We go through the front door and he walks across and there's a staircase going up. And he starts to walk up the steps and I start following up the steps, looking around the lobby and I get to the first landing and he turns and he starts to go up to the second line and I'm not in great shape. And I'm just like, does this building not have an elevator? And he goes, yeah, no, it's really old. It doesn't have an elevator. I'm like, what floor do you live on? He goes, I live on the fifth floor. Of course he does. You should go ahead. I'll (sighs) see you eventually. (laughs) So I'm (sighs) the whole time. And when I get to the fifth floor, I look down the hallway. There's a door that's open and I can hear music playing from down the hall. And I'm like, I guess that's his apartment. And I walk to the doorway and I look in and it's a really simple studio apartment. Mm -hmm. It has a bookcase. It has a TV that is playing Speed Racer, the movie. Oh, very loudly. Okay. Which is kind of polite when you think about it. You could put on porn or you could put on Speed Race the movie, which sounds like porn, but isn't porn. <sighs> so maybe it's a baby step toward porn. Because if you if the moaning is heard and then there's like Chim Chim the monkey screaming, like that's going to be awkward for people to hear. Especially I when the it said was screaming in the movie. I didn't see it. Especially at this volume because yeah. it was very loud. Yeah. And the only other thing in the room other than the door to the bathroom is a wooden futon that is conveniently made out into a bed. Mm. I go to sit down on the futon and it's a little bit rickety and I put my purse down and I'm like, could you turn down Speed Racer the movie just a little bit? And he goes, sure. And he gets up and he does it. And then he just kind of stops in front of me in the middle of the room, the very small room. And he looks at me and he goes, so, and I'm like, oh, fuck. I didn't think this through. How do you start the worst sex you ever had? Like, I'm not really sure what the next step is. And I'm just looking at him kind of expectantly. And he goes, so you want to see it? And there's (laughs) two voices in my head and. One of them is Dixie, who's just like, get over yourself, dude. And the other one needs a story in less than 24 hours. you want to see it. And that person says, yeah. (laughs) And so he ends up his pants and his kind of semi comes out. It's just like a a little bit of time had passed since that picture had been taken is my guess. Okay. It's a decent dick. It's nothing all that special and i'm just looking at it like not know. one that needs an introduction of that level <laughs> i think is what or a is title what saying <laughs> and i'm just looking at it and he's looking at me with that look like i'm blowing your mind right now with my giant dick kind of thing 
And I just look at him and go, yeah, that'll work. And I I reach into my purse and I grab a few condoms and a couple of packets of lube and hand him a condom put on his dick. And I shuck off all my clothes. And then I take the packet of lube and I cover the condom with all this lube. Yeah. And I get on my hands and knees on this very kind of shaky futon with my face pretty much looking out the window, which is not that far away. And I'm just kind of balancing there going, let's go. And he's like, okay. And his dick gets hard and he gets behind me. Now the futon is dealing with both of our weight. (laughs) And he goes to slide it inside me and he does the tiniest little incremental slide in. And then he stops and he goes, are you okay? Oh my God. Like, yeah, I'm okay. So he moves it in another little tiny fraction and he's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And he just keeps doing it. He just keeps asking me every little bit. Jesus Christ. And I'm like, God damn, I'm just, this is going to take a lot longer than I thought it was going to take. You know, I thought I was going to get out of here. And so at a certain point, starts feeling a little good. Yeah. He's moving a little bit more and he takes a deeper stroke than expected. And it slides into my ass just a little bit. Mm. And he goes, oh my God, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. (laughs) But you shouldn't go back and forth between the two holes. So I would suggest you stay back there. And he's like, what? Because who could take this monster in their ass? You know? So now he's taking tiny incremental steps and he's just like, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm just like, I'm going to be on this fucking futon when I'm supposed to be telling this story tomorrow night. And I get frustrated. And at a certain point, I just rear back and just go slam bam back, and yes. slam it all the way to the hilt. Yes. And he screams and collapses on my back. <laughs> and I'm just like, what happened? <laughs> I mean, I don't say it. I just think it. I'm like, uh was he uncircumcised he had condom on so I, but it could sometimes it gets jammed up in the anyway so what happened oh my god you're one of those people are you just gonna ask questions in the middle okay yes i am and so he just i'm waiting for him to do something and i'm like did he i can't tell if he come did he came so at a certain point he just like starts to he grabs a condom he put backs out He's, I'm still facing toward the window. I can't see him. I'm yeah. balancing. And he gets up off the futon and he goes into the bathroom and he shuts the door. And I just put my wet fucking lube soaked pussy down on the futon and sit down naked. And it's just like, uh, am I supposed to leave now? I don't know if we're done. I mean, was that it? Was that the worst sex? Speed racer still playing on the TV mm-hmm. and. After a minute, I hear the shower go on and oh, no. he's in there for a while. And then I hear the water turn off and I'm just like, I don't know if I should get up or not. And eventually he opens the door to the bathroom and he stands there and he's leaning in the doorway dressed in a bathrobe and just, I'm like, so are we done? Like, I can't tell. And he says, uh, so here's the thing. When you did that thing where you reared back on me really hard, I wasn't expecting it. And I pulled a hamstring. Oh no. And I'm in excruciating pain right now. And I say, well, I guess you're not going to walk me down those five flights of stairs. Then are you? And I get up and I put my clothes on and <laughs> And I walk out, give him the little porn star handshake. And as I leave, it occurs to me, I didn't specify who the worst sex was going to be for, (laughs) did I? You've been listening to All That and Mo. Thanks so much for spending your precious, precious time with me today. My podcast is produced by Cody Crabb. Theme music by Georg Friedrich Haas as performed by Marcus Weiss. And I look forward to spending time with you again really soon.